Yo, collect and connect with Blake and Chad. Chad and Blake. Collect and connect. Blake and Chad's collect and connect. This is Luke Chu. Dave Wrestler. Blake and Chad's. This is Blake and Chad's. This is Collect and Connect. been a branding guy for 20 years so i've created logos the websites packaging yeah. for about 20 years 300 400 brands for example i designed the uh, the identity for tiktok before it was tiktok it was called flipper brand uh hmm. designed the first you know design thayer's naturals i don't know if you've ever you yeah we see some of your brands here that you branded with man i didn't want to point those out but you're a humble guy man yeah you're definitely big one. That, was, that was my background that was yeah. you know i always had one foot out the door because that was dealing with clients but just imagine me doing that full time while like struggling trying to make my character world real and by 2005 i'd kind of given up and then i decided that Maybe. And that was the time when Facebook was picking up. There was no iPhone. And the only social network for artists was DeviantArt. And I went to a DeviantArt summit and I saw Julian, the founder, and he, everybody was talking to him. And it was, I was like, dude, that guy knows what's up. He's built something amazing. You know, he's built a community and he's built this art, you know, brand and people love it. And I'm like, I want to be like that. By the time I got home, I had the idea for the second art social network in the world, which was called Mojizu, M-O-J-I-Z-U. And Mojizu, I looked up the word a character in the dic Japanese dictionary, emoji meant character, but not as in like cute stuff. I made a mistake. It was actually like A, B, C, D characters as in letters. And Zu as the U meant to draw. So Mojizu became the character world. Uh, it became a contemporary character design community. Hmm. Within about a, a, a couple of months, I had designed the user interface. Uh, again, having that design background would help whenever I had these ideas. And uh, I got reached out by a, by a group that wanted to buy some of my characters. And I told them the characters weren't for sale. But I did, if they were really venture capitalists, I would like to talk to them about this idea. Wow. And they said, come over. And Luckily, they were like three miles away from my office. It was the strangest email ever. They had found me on DeviantArt. So I went over and uh, negotiated a deal. I got funded a million dollars to build Mojizu. And within about six months, we had it up and running. This is 2005, beginning of 2006. And we launched and it was basically the most incredible thing I've done because I had 50,000 character artists submitting characters daily, things that are sitting behind you were being submitted daily by the most incredible artists around the world. And we had emoji battle where people would battle them throughout the community with, through voting. And there would be a winner every month. And the visual aspect of this website was basically the predecessor to any uh, social network that came up after it for design and art. I know this because a lot of them would call me, the founders of Threadless called me on how to design a Social Network for Art, the founders of uh, Design by Humans, the founders of, like, I was, uh, what was it? And not Anaboom, but another anim animation site. This was early, again, pre-iPhone days. And it became a very big deal. And people started calling characters mojis. And we started to, because we called it mojis, like fresh mojis and hot mojis and things like that. And then people were able to download, use these mojis in their emails and chats in the first Moji app called the Mojicon Dispenser that I created that you could download. Damn. That's crazy. Jeez. I'm blown right yeah. now. <laughs> Pre-iPhone, pre-anybody calling Mojis, Emojis. Wow. And eventually, I think if you Google it, there is an article about me called uh, the, the Emperor of Emoji, which is a funny short little 
uh, article. Because you just said uh, you just started painting again in a tweet like 45 minutes ago uh, on a canvas, right? <laughs> yes, sir. We, we just moved, actually not just, but we moved into our home, new home about four months ago. I think I took my last photo uh, of the last studio that I had destroyed, which was my garage in the last home. And I haven't touched canvas. I've touched paper. Uh, there's, uh, I've touched a lot of uh, sketchbooks. I have the sketchbook project that you can see, which is pages out of my sketchbook that were minted on OpenSea. It's called the Sabit sketchbook. Uh, there's quite a bit of that. There was quite a bit of uh, one-on-ones on paper called, uh, Ink and flow again on OpenSea, you can see it or anywhere else. Uh, and that's ink and stuff on paper, but I haven't touched real paint and canvas for a while. Um, I painted on a wall last week and the black ink is still on. Before I touch it out, this, this stuff doesn't go away. Sweet. So you see yourself shifting more towards digitally then nowadays, other than painting on canvas or even for like, while well, shifting more towards NFTs? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been in NFTs for what, since February of last year, which is about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half. And I want to say at least 90% of my work has been digital. It, it just has to be, you know, one, for the sake of the amount that I mint and, you know, put up daily mm -hmm. um, and the details that I want to capture. And in between the paintings, I'm also creating the character worlds. Uh, so for example, you know, the Sabit Originals that's coming out soon, which is a probably a 10K plus PFP. That's a complete gift to all my holders. Um, Tokyo Punks 2, Tokyo Punks uh, Hyper Kawaii. That's a whole nother world. That's being what do I got to be a holder of to get that, that airdrop? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so so uh, any, any Sabit NFT will get you a certain number of uh, Sabit, uh, the, the originals by Sabit. So awesome. I think if really? you own any 101s, no matter how what price point you got the, that 101, it'll give you 15 free mints. If you own any um, Sabit editions, you'll get five free mints. Wow. Tokyo Punks gives you one for one. Healing Codes gives you one for one. Uh, and those are fairly inexpensive to get. So there's a lot of, um, you know, accessible NFTs in my... Uh, you know, from one on ones all the way to editions and PFPs that you can grab, uh, that'll give you the originals. Uh, the Tokyo Punks Hyper Kawaii, which is Tokyo Punks Part Two, uh, the only way to get those is one own a Tokyo Punk for one for one or purchase it at mint. So I think that'll be a 10k project. Half of it will be gifted, half of it will be sold. Oh, cool. Man, mm -hmm. I love the utilities. I mean, that's what we're hearing a that's lot. Lots of utility. That's yeah, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't call it utility, though, guys. <laughs> that's fair. Get, that's fair. You're gifting I, it. You're gifting it. I, I, <laughs> gifting, yeah. yeah that started yeah. with Tokyo Punks. You know, Tokyo Punks was an experiment, but at the same time, it was at a point in my life where I was like, okay, if I'm going to do a generative one, I don't want to promise anything. Not because I don't want to give people anything beyond the art, but I feel like art is the utility. And that was the tagline for the project. For sure. Art is the utility, love is the roadmap, which meant, I'll, you know, I'm one guy and I've never been a good manager. I've never been, at, you know, great at building companies and, you know, people behind me, whether it was back in the day when I was a design firm, I was a design firm of one. Uh, I was carrying huge contracts and huge companies, but I would only take on things that I could handle myself here the same way, right? There's a lot of utility that I'm giving in, you know, with Tokyo Punks one even, uh, and I can mention what some of those are, but I call it love because I, you know, one being legally bound by it is dangerous, right? Two being called a rug is something that I never wanted to even, you know, be close to. And three, I genuinely wanted to create art. So when you look at the way I created Tokyo Punks 1, you can go ahead and uh, go to U YouTube and press Tokyo Punks by Sabin, and I think the creation video comes up. Yep. Every single element of that was created by an Italian dip pen on a piece of paper. So there's nothing on that project that's not hand created. And so I wanted it to have its own value as art. So even if you own one of those 5,000, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, it's one of, it's my genesis a PFP project. Still a one of one in a way. Yeah. They're all one of ones. Yeah. None of, awesome. And they all look like I, I created <clears throat> scratch. 
Uh, some of them are horribly hideous. Definitely. Some of them are <laughs> some of them are really cool, but they all it's are very cool uh, ones. <laughs> yeah, I wanted it to look like that I painted every single one at the end. And essentially I did. It was just kind of being puzzled together. Um, you know, none of it was computer generated other than the fact that they were put together. I mean, throughout the process is bringing all the worlds together. So Tokyo Punks and Pixel Pop and Ugly Kitties, uh, those two are really closely related now. So Tokyo Punks and uh, Ugly Kitties are gonna be fairly related. So, you know, I don't want to give everything away, but there is, you know, I, I want to hear more though. Yeah. <laughs> we can keep going. I, I want it to be exciting to basically own an ugly kitty. I want it to be exciting to own a Tokyo Punk and what happens when they merge, right? So designer cons coming up in November. Would you be at designer con? Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot far enough for me to be able to, uh, as far as time-wise goes, to be able to put the time aside and, it's close enough uh, geolocation-wise. <laughs> Literally three, three exits down. Where can we find you at your socials, um, Instagram, Facebooks, Twitter, Twitches, whatever you have out there. This way we can post them up for you. Uh, on Instagram and, uh, and Twitter, uh, it's at Sabet, S-A-B-E-T. Uh, that's my main uh, hub. And then if you want to see the different ones, I think, on Twitter and Instagram, I think it's Ugly Kitties One and Pixel Pop. P I X O P O P. P I X O P O P. Yeah. Um, sounds, sounds all right. Good. Do you have a website as well? Where you can get yeah, sabit.art, S A B E T is, is where it's at. And then pixelpop.com. Uh, everything else kind of is out on the ether on OpenSea. And so, like tokyopunks.com is also my, but it goes to OpenSea. So that's a good one to probably put out there, especially since definitely be- as like uh, inspiring artists, you know, what can you tell them to go full a hundred percent and, you know, go- so my, my commitment to becoming a full-time painter was January 1st, 2015. So 2010 was committing to doing things I love, which was the characters by 2015, I was painting other things and I saw myself as more of a painter. And I said, you know what, I want to I want to make a living as a painter. I want to transition over to full-time painting. And how am I going to be able to do that? And I go, well, first of all, you're not painting it often enough. So that needs to change. To become a painter, you have to paint. And so what I would do is, again, mind you, I was still designing it in the background, right? Like in the front face thing, I kind of already transitioned. Most people didn't even know I did logos and websites anymore. I would get calls like, hey, do you still do branding? I'm like, hell yeah, that's how I pay my bills. <laughs> um, what do you need? Uh, today, it's like, no, not really. But if you really need it, I'll, I'll try to help you. Uh, but that transitioning period in 2015, I made a decision and said, I got to paint. So I would go to the coffee shop or at home or wherever I was, and I would set aside the morning till the afternoon where I had to pick up the kids uh, to painting. And then I would share it by the time I was done. It was also a time of healing because I was consistently painting two, three hours of painting puts you in a very alpha state. But I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of turmoil that I had been living with for, for decades. And all of a sudden it was starting to subside because I was starting to connect to source and I was creating through that, right? And so it was a lot of layers for me that was happening at the same time. And then at nights after the kids would go to sleep, I would go back to designing so I could pay the bills and I would take care of my clients like theirs and all the other companies that I was working for. That took about four years, 15 to 19. And, you know, the mistake I made in 14, which was in a year before it, was that I want to be a full-time painter. I'm not going to design anymore. Forget about clients. Well, guess what happened? I went completely broke. I couldn't pay the bills. I couldn't pay the rent. And within two months, I had to go back and find clients, right? So the, the key word here is transition. The key word for any artist that wants to do this is not quitting their day job, uh, even though everyone says, oh, you know, no plan B, no blah, blah, blah. No, there is no plan B, but you have to sustain the creativity somehow. You have to pay the bills during the day so you don't, you know, succumb to the, you know, at the end of it, you quit everything, right? Because now you can't even pay your bills. 
So for me, it was a matter of every night making sure that was being done while creating daily, sharing it, building my audience, and then eventually building programs that were exciting enough for people to want to collect my artwork. And three, educating all my collectors and my audience and my community about how I work and how I create and then share that out. So they become my, you know, the people who spread the love, right? And there's a love circle that happens in art where it doesn't happen in a design business, where it doesn't happen in a service business. You know, someone might recommend you because they love their logo, but they might also not, right? And you're, you're only good as, you know, the project you're working on. And when they're done with you, it's usually over, right? Like you go look at your stuff, it's visual. You're like, man, it pops more than a canvas, like you said, but you still, it, it gravitates you back to a physical because look at all the stuff I've gotten. I haven't collected sure. physicals in probably a good 10 years, at least, right? Kids yeah. and all that are getting them all their stuff. And, and all of a sudden I'm back into NFTs and I'm like, full circle give me anything physical right now because man i want to match it with my nft and i, I want to no, match I, I, my I, I, nft I, with a physical that's most most feels, of my goals right now it feels amazing i mean today i uh, i shipped out a, a a first physical that i sold today in a long while a small one and uh i was like you know what i think i'm going to gift him the nft because he just wanted the physical uh, so I, I minted it as a one-on-one and I gifted it to him, which was valued probably just the same as what he paid for the physical, wow. but you know, that's hey, amazing, man. Definitely. Yeah. So you're going to do That's love right there. Yeah. yeah that's what's up, man.